Today is Tuesday, December the 1st, 2020. The independent news organization International Middle East Media Center reports the following. Israeli soldiers invaded Tuesday, Sir Bahar town and occupied Jerusalem and demolished a Palestinian home. Israeli soldiers invaded Tuesday Ziv village south of the southern West Bank city of Hebron before demolishing a cave and an agricultural shed. Israeli soldiers abducted on Tuesday at dawn, 11 Palestinians from their homes in several parts of the occupied West Bank. Palestinian forced to demolish his home in Jerusalem. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict is brewing. Today, four panelists will help us better understand what is going on by sharing their personal stories and academic findings. Hello, I'm Charles Powell, and welcome to the conversation about peace in absentia, Jewish, Christian, and Muslim voices on Arab-Israeli normalization. I am coming to you live from the Ansari Institute for Global Engagement with Religion, located in the Keough School for Global Affairs on the campus of the University of Notre Dame. In January 2020, the United States announced a Mideast peace plan that supports the Israeli position on most issues rather than fostering Israeli-Palestinian compromise. In recent months, it has brokered deals to normalize relations between Israel and multiple Arab states. The normalizations have come after the U.S. has already moved its embassy to Jerusalem and declared that Israeli settlements on occupied Palestine do not violate international law. Of course, this move raises some very important and high profile questions, such as, how can peace deals between Israel and the Palestinians be negotiated without Palestinians at the table? What do Palestinians think about the recent U.S.-backed peace deals in the Middle East? How should Jews, who are concerned for both the prosperity of Israel and justice for Palestinians, ethically position themselves between the two sides? In the words of Director Mahan Mirza of the Ansari Institute, what role does religion play, if any, in fanning the flames of conflict or calming the waters of peace? Our panel for this discussion features academics, faith leaders, and journalists who will share their insights on what they believe to be the best path for sustainable peace in the region. Featuring voices that are typically absent or silenced in public and policy discourses, this conversation aims to expand our perspectives on one of the most intractable conflicts of our time. This event is presented by the Ansari Institute and co-sponsored by the Liu Institute for Asia and Asian Studies, the Program in Arabic and Middle Eastern Studies, and the Department of Classics at the University of Notre Dame. I am joined today by Reverend Dr. Mitri Rahib, he is the founder and president of Dar al Kalima University College of Arts and Culture in Bethlehem. He is the most widely published Palestinian theologian to date. Reverend Mitri has authored and edited 24 books, including I Am a Palestinian Christian and Bethlehem Besieged, Faith in the Face of Empire, The Bible Through Palestinian Eyes. In 2012, the German Media Prize was awarded to Reverend Mitri for his tireless work in creating room for hope for his people, who, living under Israeli occupation through funding and building institutions of excellence in education, culture, and health. The work of Reverend Mitri has received wide media attention from major international media outlets and networks, including CNN, ABC, CBS, 60 Minutes, BBC, ARD, ZDF, DWBR, Newsweek, Al Jazeera, and others. Reverend Mitri, thank you for joining us. My next guest is Rabbi Brant Rosen. He is the founding rabbi of Zedek Chicago and the co-founder of the Jewish Voice for Peace Rabbinical Council. He is a vocal activist for justice and human rights, particularly in Israel-Palestine. 
after publicly wrestling with his relationship to Israel and openly, openly questioning his lifelong Zionism, he eventually became a prominent Jewish presence in the Palestine Solidarity Movement. Rabbi Rosen's writings have appeared in numerous publications and periodicals, and his book, Wrestling in the Daylight, A Rabbi's Path to Palestinian Solidarity, was published in 2012 by Just World Books. He is currently a 2020 fellow in the Religion, Conflict, and Peace Initiative at Harvard Divinity School. Rabbi Rosen, welcome to the panel. Thanks so much for having me. And joining us from California is Dr. Hatem Bazian. Dr. Bazian is a co-founder and professor of Islamic law and theology at Zatuna College, the first accredited Muslim liberal arts college in the United States. Dr. Bazian is also a lecturer in the Department of Near Eastern and Asian American and Asian Diaspora Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. He teaches courses on Islamic law and society. Islam in America, Communities and Institutions, Deconstructing Islamophobia and Othering of Islam, Religious Studies and Middle Eastern Studies. Among other positions, Dr. Bazian is founder and national chair of American Muslims for Palestine. His recent book, Palestine, It is Something Colonial, Dr. Bazian discusses the long-term ramifications regarding the occupation of Palestine as it was the last settler colonial project the British Empire commissioned. And this colonial project is still unfolding more than 100 years later. This is a topic we will engage in in just a few moments. Dr. Bazian, welcome to the conversation. Thank you for having me, look forward to it. And I'm also very pleased to welcome <clears throat> Leila Al Haddad to the conversation. Layla was born in Kuwait to Palestinian parents from Gaza. She currently lives in Clarksville, Maryland with her family. Layla is an award-winning Palestinian author, social activist, policy analyst, and journalist. She frequently speaks on the situation in Gaza, the intersection of food and politics, her own personal journey as a Palestinian mother and journalist, as well as on contemporary Islam. She has written for numerous newspapers and magazines, including the Washington Post, International Herald Tribune, the New Statesman, and the Daily Star. She has appeared on many international broadcasting networks, including NPR, CNN, Al Jazeera, and CCTV. She is the author of Gaza Mom, Palestine, Politics, Parenting, and Everything in Between. Layla is also the co-editor of the anthology Gaza Unsilenced. From 2003 to 2007, Layla was the Gaza correspondent for the Al Jazeera English website and a regular contributor to the BBC World Service, during which time she covered such events as the Gaza disengagement and the 2006 Palestinian elections. She also co-directed two Gaza-based documentaries, including the award-winning Tunnel Trade, through her work as a writer and documentaries, uh, including the award-winning Tunnel Trade, uh, excuse me, through her work as a writer and documentarian, uh, she provides much needed insight into the human experience of the region. In her spare time, she volunteers with Syrian refugee relief and resettlement efforts in Maryland, as well as advocating for Palestinian rights through her involvement with various community and national groups, including the US Campaign for Palestinian Rights and American Muslims for Palestine. Layla, welcome to the conversation. On behalf of the entire team at the Ansari Institute, welcome. To our live audience, welcome. As mentioned earlier, I'm Dr. Charles Powell, affiliate faculty at the Ansari Institute, adjunct professor of Muslim Christian dialogue at Holy Cross College, Notre Dame, visiting fellow at the Oxford Center for Islamic Studies, UK, and former Protestant pastor. While attending Catholic Theological Union in Chicago, I wrote my doctoral dissertation on the important role of narrative empathy, especially as it relates to interreligious dialogue and peace building. Narrative empathy has the power to change one's perception and attitude. It is a powerful tool by which people from diverse backgrounds, be it political, social, cultural, or religious, can feel the human connection. 
a connection that can create a space for objectivity and respectful truth speaking. Today, I invite each of you to share your narrative, a narrative that will give voice to the sea of drowned out voices. Audience, you will surely have some questions. So I invite you to type questions into the chat box and if time permits, we will give the panelists an opportunity to respond. Let's begin. Dr. Hattam, again, welcome to the conversation. Your new book is titled, Palestine. It is something colonial. Explain what that means and how we can see the recent normalizations in light of a colonial narrative. Um, the title of the book actually emerges out of a statement that uh, Theodore Herzl in a letter to Cecil Rhodes uh, at the time where he was searching for the construction of a Jewish state. And he said, why do I turn to you in such a matter? Uh, he said, because it is something colonial. So at the turn of the 20th century, uh, at the height of British colonialism, uh, Zionism at least became the junior partner uh, of Great Britain out of uh, the uh, intensive period of anti-Semitism that was what that we experienced in Europe, uh, there was a search for how to address this issue. So addressing anti-Semitism by means of embracing a colonial project that the British for their own purposes, both uh, uh, anti-Semitism in Great Britain at the time, as well as strategic positioning for Great Britain on Egypt to guarantee their trade with India because both Egypt and India were a colonial possession for the British. So in order for us to approach Palestine, one has to actually think and understand the conflict as being constituted around a settler colonial project that continues to unfold and pointing out that early Zionism as it arrived to Palestine uh, represented the epistemological construct, the point of view of settler colonialism that was experienced in other areas in the world, both in the Southern Hemisphere, Africa, Asia, and Latin America. My intent was to really remove this exceptional view that often people say that Palestine is complicated. For me, nuclear physics and so on is complicated. There is nothing complicated in understanding settler colonialism and the various tools that are introduced, including how religion often has been used within settler colonial project. We know it as manifest destiny. So there is nothing unique in using religion as a discourse to try to provide a way to, to say that God actually is on my side in actually taking your land. So in this sense, for me is to actually remove this whole notion that there is something that is ununderstandable relative to the question of Palestine and what we are seeing in Palestine over the past hundred plus years. Thank you. Dr. Hatem, can you take Hatem, can you take just a few moments and briefly explain to the audience uh, how you identify as a Palestinian? Well, uh, for me as a Palestinian, my family is uh, both originate from Nablus and my mother, my dad is from Nablus uh, in the West Bank and my mother is from Jerusalem. My, myself and my brother were the only two that were born in Amman, Jordan after my family moved to Jordan. So my experience as Palestinian was crossing the bridge to visit uh, in the summer, uh, the West Bank to visit Nablus and Jerusalem. And my first really experience with uh, seeing a Jewish person uh, was actually crossing the bridge and seeing a, uh, an Israeli soldier that was searching my mother in her underwear and I'm standing next to her at age five uh, and he is using the electric uh, what you call metal detector over her body and I'm standing there and then waiting for my shoes to be given back to me after they took my, our shoes, our luggage. So that's for me as a Palestinian, that's my experience is really governed by a structure uh, of actually treating you as something that is not human, something that is different and does not belong to uh, the normal patterns. And again, crossing the uh, bridge, which is literally, I, 
call it a bridge is a little bit, you know, I'm here in the Bay Area, you have the Golden Gate Bridge, the Bay Bridge. When you speak about bridge, you think of a massive bridge. This is like almost 20 to 25 feet or maybe less, but it takes you a whole day to cross it. You start at almost four o'clock in the morning uh, from uh, Amman, you go into the Jordanian side, you go through the whole search at the Jordanian side, then you cross the bridge, you remove all of your luggage, all your shoes are taken away from you. And that process, by the time you finish, it's almost five o'clock in the evening or six o'clock in the evening that you actually just to cross this whole area. So for me as a Palestinian, it's always this notion that you are seeing from the lens of uh, subhuman and also a security threat. Now, when you come to the West, and again, I came here to the United States to study uh, to begin with, and you have to deal with the erasure. You know, the first question you say, where are you from? I'm from Palestine. Well, it does not exist. Um, or some of us who are born, let's say in uh, Jerusalem or Nablus, you wanna put that on your passport as you become a naturalized citizen. You can't do that. So the structure of erasure in there, in academia as well, uh, the structure of knowledge production is seen through the relationship between the United States and Israel. So you're always having to have an uphill battle, even within academic arena, because you are challenging, or at least you are narrating a different narrative, a different history uh, that you have experienced as well as the long durée. So even if you say, I'm from Palestine, well, the maps do, don't show Palestine. And even saying Palestinian or to say Palestine, Palestinian is a political statement. And those who are engaged in academia know this uh, uphill battle that everything about Palestine is contested. Now, when you get into theology and religious studies, uh, uh, the whole discussions about Palestine gets uh, wrapped up into speculative theology, wrapped up into end of time scenarios, wrapped up into this whole notion, which I think it becomes a whole market relative to Palestine that is unrecognizable to me, uh, rather than speaking about the culture, the history, the tradition, a civilization of almost 10,000 plus years of continuous inhabitation, you begin to deal with something that is almost uh, to say it's part of Star Wars will be even an extension is even much more than this type of analysis and approach relative to Palestine. So that's for me as a Palestinian, I, you have to deal with all these elements uh, uh, to the level again, some of us who are engaged to the level of our own food is also contested. You know, there's a whole debate uh, about all types of food that is actually uh, also be, become part of the contestation of the particular identity, scope, and history of a Palestinian. Dr. Bazian, thank you. Uh, the next question is going to go to Reverend Mitri. Uh, as we get to this question, Reverend Mitri, if you would also share with us briefly how you identify as a Palestinian, and then I want to ask you a few questions about Christian Zionism. But first, how do you identify as a Palestinian? Um, I ident identify myself as uh, a Palestinian, a Arab Christian, uh, born in Bethlehem. I know it sounds biblical, but this is how it is. I mean, um, I was born across the street from where Jesus was born. I mean, literally across the street. Um, my family, uh, uh, they have their roots in Bethlehem. So we are a, a Bethlehemite family with 100 years of existence in this city. Um, our uh, culture is Arab, so we are Arabs. Uh, if you come to our church, we worship in Arabic. Um, our food, I mean, everything. And we are Palestinians, uh, uh, part of the Palestinian people who are connected and have been connected to this land since centuries, uh, if not millennia. Uh, and all of that as one unity with no contradiction. Thank you. Uh, maybe just to add, in addition, I'm even a Protestant Lutheran uh, pastor. So that makes things even more interesting. Yes. So thank you, Reverend Mitri. I would like to ask you a question regarding Christian Zionism. For many Americans, Christian Zionism is best summed up in the words of the late Jerry Falwell, who 
uh, was an American pastor, author, educator, activist, and founder of the Moral Majority. He said, to stand against Israel is to stand against God. And I've shared with you, I was a Protestant minister for many years, and this was taught to me at a very young age as well. Pastor and tele-evangelist John Hagee, in an article titled, Why Evangelicals Stand with Israel, the Principles of Christian Zionism, says, evangelicals believe the Bible to be the Holy Spirit-inspired, inerrant Word of God. The Word and will of God are synonymous, and thus Israel is the only nation created by a sovereign act of God. Moreover, evangelicals support Israel because Christianity owes a debt of eternal gratitude to the Jewish people for their contributions to us. Judaism does not need Christianity to explain its existence. Christianity cannot explain its existence without Judaism. And finally, Pastor Hagee says, evangelicals support Israel because God promised Abraham in Genesis 12, 3, I will bless those who bless you and will curse those who curse you. Director Mahan, a few moments ago, uh, when we were getting to know each other behind the scenes, he said, remember, in many ways, you're speaking to middle America. A lot of people, this is what they've been taught in Protestant, especially evangelical circles. And you've already shared with us that you identify as a Palestinian Christian and theologian, a Protestant. You actively stand for the Palestinians. How is your belief different from that of those just mentioned? Oh, I mean, there is a huge difference. Uh, you know, uh, actually, uh, Christian Zionists uh, do not relate to us even when they come to visit uh, Israel. Uh, they don't come to Palestine and they don't connect with us. They think we are not kosher Christians. Um, now, what is the difference between us and them? Um, uh, one important question for me is, are the text of the Bible text of liberation or text of occupation. For Christian Zionists, the Bible is, is the text of occupation. Uh, this is why Joshua plays an important role in their theology. For me, the Bible actually are texts of liberation. Uh, and uh, the liberation of Palestinians is really for me is at the heart of the Bible. I see it there because also the liberation uh, of the uh, Jews from uh, empires in the past was also at the heart uh, of the Old Testament. Uh, the other thing is, can we weaponize the Bible uh, for settler colonialism? I mean, Hatim spoke about this. This was done in South Africa. This was done in Australia. This was done in America indigenous people. Uh, I don't believe that this is uh, what God really wants. Um, so for me, settler colonialism is a sin. It's not something actually to promote as, as Christians. And so uh, the other question is, as, as Christians, as people of faith, uh, is equality something important to us? Uh, can we believe that God actually supports white supremacy or Israeli supremacy or Jewish supremacy? Or do we believe in God where we are all equals before him as sinners and people who need liberation? And so I don't buy, you know, uh, white supremacy or Israeli supremacy based on the Bible. For me, equality is something I cannot actually compromise on. Uh, another question is, can we uh, uh, actually, as Christians, violate human rights in the name of divine rights? I mean, uh, not only as Christians, as Jews, as Muslims, can we, can we use the Bible uh, as a tool to violate uh, the human rights of others? I believe no, because as a Christian, I believe that God became human in Jesus, meaning actually all human beings are being sanctified. So every human being is actually precious in the, in the eyes of God. And there is no way that I can use biblical text or Quranic text or so to violate the rights of other or even international law. We cannot go back 
Um, and uh, another thing which you, I think, mentioned in your, in your words, can we give a state, any state, divine quality? <laughs> and what happens if we give a state divine quality? And this is what you quoted actually from John Hege is giving the state of Israel divine qualities. This is so dangerous because actually this uh, leads to despotism. This leads to, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, a state that can violate all rights. We had it, uh, you know, with Hitler. We had it with many other uh, groups. Uh, and so the question at the end for me is. For, or for me, justice is a, always a, pre, a prerequisite to peace. There is no peace without justice. And truth is prerequisite to reconciliation. There is no reconciliation without truth. So this is, I think, where we differ, I mean, from, from a Christian Zionist like day and night. Thank you. Speak to us for just a few moments. What does worship uh, look like in your particular church throughout the week? Uh, what are the demographics? Uh, tell us a little bit about the heartbeat of your ministry there. Right. Um, I mean, uh, Christians uh, worldwide, they make 7% of the Palestinian people. In Palestine right now, around 2% are Christians. Uh, they belong to diverse uh, um, denominations. We have 12 recognized denominations, uh, in addition to many other smaller Protestant communities. Um, if you come to uh, our church, uh, it's, uh, it's a small church, uh, but it's, uh, it's a vibrant church. Um, we have lots of young people. This is the demography of Palestine again. Um, our worship is in Arabic. Um, but you come to our church and the church was built in the 19th century by Germans. So you will see uh, stained glass windows. Uh, if you look at them, you think Jesus was Scandinavian with his blue eyes and blonde hair. And I always like to say, you know, Jesus was, you know, a Palestinian Jew. So he looks exactly like me uh, and not like, you know, the Scandinavians or, you know, um, um, for us, uh, youth work is important, uh, women work is important, um, but uh, several years ago we felt a call to start a university. The church has been always in, engaged in education. Uh, the first Lutheran school was uh, established in Bethlehem back in 1854. So already my grandfather went to Lutheran school, my father went to Lutheran school, I went to Lutheran school, and my daughters went to Lutheran school. So we have that long tradition with the focus on education. Very good, thank you. And we'll get back to this topic uh, later on in the conversation you have described the West Bank, I believe, as Swiss cheese. And we'll come back and talk about that and how that can interfere with perhaps everyday uh, worship with your congregation and the ability to visit family in other parts there. The next uh, question I'd like to uh, offer is to Rabbi Ro Rosen, uh, Rosen, excuse me. The boycott, divestment and sanctions movement is a Palestinian led movement promoting boycotts, divestments and sanctions against Israel. Its objective is to pressure Israel to meet what it describes as Israel's obligations under international law, defined as withdrawal from the occupied territories, removal of the separation barrier in the West Bank, uh, full equality for Arab Palestinian citizens of Israel, and respecting, protecting, and promoting the rights of Palestinian refugees to return to their homes and properties. The movement is organized and coordinated by the Palestinian BDS National Committee. Critics say BDS is anti-Semitic, delegitimatizes Israel, and resembles historical discrimination against Jews. The United States Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says that BDS is anti-Semitic. As an activist, as a Jew, uh, what say you? Well, the first thing I, I'd like to point out 
uh, before I get into BDS, I'd just like to address the tail end of the Christian Zionism conversation just briefly. Uh, I think it's important to note in everything, in addition to everything that's been said about Christian Zionism is that Christian Zionism is at heart an anti-Semitic ideology in as much as it uses the Jewish people as pawns in this Christian narrative that points toward the end of days. In other words, according to the religious, ideo religious ideology of Christian Zionism, the Jewish return to historic Palestine will be the precursor to Armageddon, the coming of the Christian Messiah and the destruction of all those who do not accept this Messiah, presumably Jews. Uh, so that's an important piece in all of this. Um, it's also important to note that uh, Christians, there are many millions of Christian Zionists in the world. There are 9 million Christian Zionists who are members of Pastor Hagee's, John Hagee's Christians United for Israel. So we're talking about that, that's more, more people than there are Jews in this country. So we're talking about a massive movement and it's important also to keep in mind that Zionism is an interfaith movement. It's not uniquely Jewish uh, in as much as there are millions of Christian Zionists worldwide. It's also important to note that Mike Pompeo is himself a Christian Zionist, uh, as is uh, Mike Pence, the vice president of the United States. So all of this is really important context when we talk about Mike Pompeo's proclamation of BDS as anti-Semitic, which I find problematic on so many level, levels, not least of which is that I believe Mike Pompeo belongs to a movement, a religious movement that is itself inherently anti-Semitic. Uh, I and think you know, very briefly, I also uh, saw that currently in the United States Congress, there are 53.7% of Protestants in the House and 60% of Protestants in the Senate. And of course, though not all Protestants agree with the aforementioned statements about uh, Christian Zionism, uh, spokesman Marsha Whitman told Jewish Insider, it is clear from the outcome of the races so far, referring to those that recently took place, that the elected and re-elected senators and representatives from both parties will be joining an overwhelmingly pro-Israel Congress. How do you respond to many Christians, and particularly evangelical Christians, who hardly believe uh, believe this idea that a stand against Israel is a stand against God? Can you elaborate just a bit more on that? Yes, well, I think um, it's this is a trend uh, that we should we should uh, regard for all of the reasons that we've heard, uh, particularly what Mitri was saying about um, understanding nationalism or nation stateism as uh, somehow a God given uh, movement that somehow God can uh, ordain the establishment of of political nation states in the world. That is already uh, a recipe for, uh, for disaster uh, in so many ways. And I think uh, we've been, so many of us have been noting with alarm the rise of the evangelical movement within the political ranks of the United States and with the Trump administration uh, having uh, the vice president of the United States uh, as a Christian Zionist so that close uh, to, the, to the executive to executive power and the secretary of state himself being a Christian Zionist really speaks to the ascension that you're talking about of this very, very troubling and problematic religious ideology, at least from my point of view. Um, to, to address your question about BDS, uh, BDS is not anti-Semitic. Uh, BDS, as you pointed out, is a call from Palestinian civil society that is rooted in human rights uh, with three essential goals, none of which has to do uh, with the destruction of the Jewish people or the Jew uh, of uh, uh, um, anti-Semitism against Jews. It has to do with uh, honoring the right of return of Palestinian refugees, which is enshrined in, in international law, uh, an end to the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, uh, and equal rights for Palestinian citizens of Israel. Uh, that is what the BDS call is about. Um, so I often hear the canard expressed uh, in a few ways. Uh, one is that well, it's reminiscent of uh, boycotts against Jews. I often hear the Nazi boycott against the Jewish people in Europe uh, invoked in reference to BDS, uh, which is a such an inherently problematic comparison uh, to compare a popular boycott, uh, which is by an oppressed people for international uh, solidarity against uh, a colonial 
power that's oppressing them is very, very different, inherently different from a government uh, imposed boycott on, my, on a minority that lives in that country. Uh, boycott is, has been a time honored uh, tactic of nonviolence and we enshrine it in this country. In the United States, uh, we talk about the Montgomery boycott and lift it up as a very, very important uh, liberation struggle, civil rights struggle in, in, in American history. We lift up the United Farm Workers boycott in California as a very important part of the history of this country. Uh, we uh, certainly regard the boycott of apartheid South Africa as something that was justified and legitimate uh, in the, str the struggle of uh, Africans, Black Africans against apartheid in that country. Uh, that is uh, what we are talking about when we talk about BDS, which is very much in, in that tradition. Uh, we also hear uh, the claim that, well, it's, there's a double standard, that it's somehow picking out Jews or picking out the Jewish state of all of the the horrible oppressive nations in, in the world, why are we singling out Israel uh, for condemnation and boycott? And again, that misses the essential point of, of the BDS call. Uh, the BDS call at its heart is a call for solidarity with Palestinians who are being denied their basic human rights. Uh, in the absence of some kind of equitable uh, justice-based political solution, they are calling for popular support from the international community. So the question that's before us is not, well, what about all of these other countries that are doing horrible things? The question that's before us is, do we support that call or don't we? Uh, do we see that call as legitimate or don't we? And if we do, then we are, from a moral point of view, duty bound. And I believe uh, as a religious Jew that responding to the, to the BDS call is not only a, uh, a political imperative, but a religious imperative. And I've written about this. Uh, that I, I believe that there is a sacred importance in responding to the call of the oppressed. Uh, that's not a double standard. That's simply uh, uh, taking that call at face value and discerning whether or not we want, we feel it's worthy of our support. Uh, there are many, many other reasons why I think uh, the, the uh, characterization of BDS is really um, a canard. Uh, I think it's ultimately being weaponized uh, by uh, by Israel advocates, by the Israel lobby, uh, the the, Is the Israeli government, which has a an, an entire ministry that's devoted to fighting BDS. Now, hundreds of millions of dollars are being spent by Israel advocacy organizations and the government of Israel to fight BDS because clearly there was a political calculation that was made that uh, using uh, BDS as a weapon. Uh, against the, the Palestine, Palestinians and Palestinian solidarity activists was, uh, was uh, going to be a, uh, an effective tactic. And so far, uh, I, I'm sorry to say it has been, we're seeing the rise of legislation that's literally criminalizing BDS, criminalizing the acceptance of the call that I've just been describing for you uh, in state legislatures uh, around this country and um, um, the the acceptance of the definition of BDS as anti-Semitism um, and defining anti-Zionism as anti-Semitism, which is something we can talk about as well, I think has been key to this tactic. And unfortunately, it's been finding traction. Thank you. Your perspective is powerful. Thank you for sharing it with us. I want to share a written statement that also went out a few years back. This is by uh, the Reverend John Jenkins, who is the president of the University of Notre Dame. He put forth this statement in response to the American Studies Association boycott of Israel's higher education institutions. He said, the American Studies Association's recent vote to boycott Israeli academic institutions is an infringement on academic freedom. And I join with other university presidents in condemning it. From a hill overlooking Bethlehem to the south and Jerusalem to the north, the University of Notre Dame's Institute for Ecumenical Studies has been for decades a place where scholars and students of all faiths the world over have gathered to better understand religious traditions, including relationships among Christians, Jews, and Muslims. However intractable the conflict among Israelis and Palestinians may appear, dialogue, not boycott, is more likely to produce understanding. Institutions of higher education in particular 
as well as those associated with them should champion the free exchange of ideas and not seek to impede it. Rabbi Rosen, uh, what do you think about uh, those statements that have been made? Again, I think those statements twist the essential, uh, the essential function, the, the essential ideology of, of, of BDS. Uh, the academic boycott is not about impinging on anyone's academic freedom. Uh, it is a boycott of institutions. And the, the, boy, the B of BDS has always been about boycotting institutions and saying we're not going to collaborate with institutions that are uh, collaborating with the occupation. Uh, universities, uh, almost all of the major universities in, uh, in Israel uh, work together hand in hand with the Israeli military and are absolutely complicit uh, in the occupation and thus in the oppression of the Palestinian people. It's not in any way trying to compromise their ability to do what they do or to compromise their academic freedom. It's simply saying we're not going to work with you. We're not going to um, have you at our conferences. Uh, we don't collaborate with oppression. Um, and that's what this is about. Um, to say uh, that the answer is dialogue rather than, um, than boycott, you know, whenever I hear that, you know, I always think, the first thing I think of is Martin Luther King's uh, letter from a Birmingham jail. Uh, you know, Martin Luther King was certainly a proponent of boycotts uh, in Jim Crow South. And when he came down to Birmingham to, uh, su to support uh, the, the civil rights movement there, he, he was told by liberal clergy in Birmingham that we need to engage, uh, we need to dialogue, don't come here and, and cause uh, tension. Uh, and what we need is more dialogue, not more confrontation. And what King was saying from the Birmingham jail was that, that freedom is not given voluntarily by the oppressor, it must be demanded by the oppressed. It's reminiscent of what Frederick Douglass said when he said that power can seize nothing without a demand. So, you know, yes, we need dialogue, but first, as, as Reverend Mitri said, we need justice. Uh, you know, peace without justice is no peace at all. Thank you. Well, the next question uh, is for you, Layla. Thank you for being patient. We look forward to hearing your thoughts now. Uh, Layla, you have spent a significant amount of time with the Palestinian people, and you frequently speak on the situation in Gaza. You seek to give the people in Gaza a voice. When people hear of the Gaza Strip, what do you think they hear, and what do you think they should be hearing? Uh, hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, yeah, to clarify, of course, I'm one of the Palestinian people. <laughs> it sounds like, you know, when I spent some time with them, <laughs> I was um, yes. visiting right. or something. But anyways, um, no, you're absolutely right. Gaza, of course, is, you know, part and parcel of Palestine as a whole. I always like to remind people of that. Um, and unfortunately, it's kind of um, because of the um, longstanding blockade and isolation it's endured, it's often viewed as its own kind of, you know, um, territory issue, et cetera. Um, but it, it is kind of a um, microcosm of the, uh, you know, the, the Palestinian struggle as a whole, I would say the Palestinian experience. And in terms of, you know, what are people's misconceptions or what do they think of when they think of Gaza? I think, I mean, a lot of the phrases that I've been hearing um, are, are at the heart of the problem, right? It's not just Gaza, but when we think of Palestine, we think of conflict, we think of intractable, we think of all of these words um, that kind of make me, you know, um, grimace like this. And, you know, I always refer to it as the Palestinian struggle or the Palestinian experience. It's not a conflict um, between equals. It's not uh, something intractable like, um, you know, Hatsum was saying earlier. It's there's, you know, uh, I think he said something like nuclear physics is, is, is complicated, but the Palestinian um, struggle is, is really not at its heart. And um, I think what aggravates um, the problem when we talk about narratives or perception is precisely these kinds of characterizations. And when we're talking about Gaza, because it's been highlighted in the media, I think um, so often and so, you know, in such an unfair way, it, it's, you know, we think of it in caricatures is what I've often said, right? So it's either um, Gaza, the, um, the victim or Gaza, um, the aggressor or, you know, uniquely both victim and aggressor is how um, I've often put it, right? So um, 
on one hand, it's often pitied by, you know, um, well-meaning um, allies and, and supporters, um, you know, or it's viewed as, again, um, the aggressor in all sense, you know, the, the place from which rockets emanate and terrorists are bred and children are, um, you know, are raised to hate and, and so on and so forth. And so then, you know, um, the occupier, the, the, the colonist is left with no choice but to continue and isolated and, and blockaded and, and, and on and on. And, um, you know, when we, again, when I usually start, when I'm spe specifically speaking to students or audiences that are not familiar, I, I usually start with slides that say, you know, this is often what we think of when we think of Gaza. And it's usually an image of sort of um, a far out, zoomed out image um, from above of a bombed out like neighborhood or something, very anonymous, very violent. And we have a very difficult time putting faces, um, human faces or human experiences to those images, right? And, and that makes, you know, um, if we talk about intractable, that's probably what makes things intractable is, is the perpetuation of these kinds of images and, and absence of, of human voices and, um, and narratives and experiences. And um, that's part of what led me to the work that I do today, you know, with less of a focus on sort of hard news and hard journalism that I was involved in before and, and more of sort of highlighting using other um, lenses and, and tools to be able to highlight the Palestinian experience, experience and um, you know, um, amplify um, Palestinian voices specifically in Gaza, where really what I say is then if you go out of that image, that uh, sort of anonymous violent, you know, from afar image and you zoom in, um, then can you begin to imagine if you zoom in into people's homes and neighborhoods and, and kitchens and so on and so forth, what are the conversations that are happening there and what kinds of images are we seeing and faces and, um, and, and struggles, very hu human, you know, everyday, um, you know, struggle, struggles to survive, right? Um, and, um, and so those are, you know, I believe the second part of your question is what, what do I wish or what do that people could see? And it's precisely that, right? It's those very ordinary mundane moments that I've tried to focus on so often um, that are happening and, and details that, that really happen anywhere in the world, but are just absent when it comes to, to coverage or images, um, images of Gaza. Um, you know, and I could go on and on, but if you have something specific, um, I'm happy to, to address well, it. Um, sure, you know, this brings us right into uh, the book that you've recently authored, Gaza Mom, uh, Palestine, Politics and Everything in Between. And you are co-author of the uh, critically uh, acclaimed book, The Gaza Kitchen, A Palestine Culinary Journey. Uh, with some of those works as a starting point, and you've already uh, mentioned this just a bit, but do you think that Palestinian voices are being heard? You know, so often, as you mentioned a few moments ago, people who visit Israel and who frequent, frequently watch the uh, various news outlets, they see Palestinians as day laborers or as uh, terrorists. So can you help us develop a narrative empathy for the Palestinians by portraying to us their humanity, their suffering, uh, as well as their dreams, especially the dreams of moms like yourself and children? Yeah, I mean, um, the, the most recent book I think you're referring to was The Gaza Kitchen. Um, the first one, the, the memoir, was, was Gaza Mom. But, but in both of those, I, what I do try to do is, um, is you know, highlight like the everyday ordinary moments. And, um, you know, and I should preface this like by saying that it's, it's always really frustrating, even though I recognize it's significant, it's important that we as Palestinians have to sort of um, establish our humanity, right? Before, <laughs> before an audience or before we can even get to like the meat of the problem, we have to say, hey, everyone, we're human, um, just like you. And we, you know, um, we have children and we love them and we're trying to raise them, but this is, the unfortunate reality, it's such an uphill battle. And um, I think in the conversation we were having before the program started, Hatim was saying something about like everything we're say we say is somehow construed as controversial now. And, and that's so true. We're always like, you know, second guessing um, what we're saying or, or we're just because of the immense amount of um, political pressure, erasure, you know, scrutiny that, that Palestinians are subject to not just you know in the academic realms but but elsewhere as well in social media and you know and everywhere right journalism um so yes this is the unfortunate reality that we have to say we're human um but but again i i recognized early on in my career that it was you know 
it was really frustrating to have to write the same headline over and over again every single day. And I felt like the same headline that I was writing, you know, one month ago, one week ago, could have been the one I was going to write in 10 years time. And really it came down to me is how can I better convey this Palestinian experience um, to a wider audience that may not be as familiar and even those who may be familiar, but just, the, you know, everything gets bogged down in the details. You know, how can I convey that experience to them in such a way that, you know, it translates sort of effectively into a real life, you know, maybe not sort of as grandiose as a policy change, but in a way that would help them make better informed decisions when they vote, when they whatever, in their conversations with people. And, you know, this sort of was crystallized to me in conversations I had early on with, with friends that lived very close to Gaza and Egypt and elsewhere in the Middle East at the time, in trying to share my frustrations at the constant, you know, border closures, the difficulty of crossing into Palestine as a Palestinian. I think this is something that we probably don't talk about enough. We talk so much about, you know, the politics of it all and, and you know, just solutions and whatnot. And we, we kind of forget that more Palestinians live on the outside than they do on the inside of Palestine, just because they're prevented from, you know, visiting and living in their own homeland. And I, th I think this is something that really boggles the mind of a lot of people who are not familiar with the Palestinian struggle and we're just trying to break it down to the basics. But I realized that even these people who lived in close proximity to Palestine really lacked the basic understanding of what it meant to live as a Palestinian on a daily basis, right? And so that's at that point is when I started to, you know, very early on initially write about my sort of personal experiences as a mother and journalist and Palestinian and what that was like. <clears throat> and I was really surprised at how much that resonated with, you know, average readers. And so from there, I, you know, veer towards other means and avenues, like how else can I be able to highlight the Palestinian narrative? Um, and that's when I sort of um, shifted towards, um, you know, uh, the culinary world and food. And, you know, it's just as one component as a conversation starter, because, you know, as we know, that's where the real conversations happen um, and it is in the kitchen, as, as I like to say, um, and where, um, you know, they're sustained and where um, families, I think, Palestinian families can exercise some semblance of control when everything else, all the situation is completely out of their control. Um, and so I thought that would be an interesting place to start, you know, um, start the conversation and from and from there bring in other audiences, like you were saying, um, Charles, that, that aren't familiar um, with Palestine. And I felt like it was a more grounded way to approach the, the issue and um, and to be able to kind of um, really materially affect, I think, um, have some change both on the ground and, and elsewhere in terms of like amplifying voices and also reaching, reaching other people. Yes, thank you. Dr. Bazian, I want to ask you now about Christian, uh, not Christian, but uh, Muslim Zionism. Uh, Reverend Mitri speaks of Christian Zionism, uh, and we talked with him briefly about that. And uh, I want to hear more about what you have to say about Muslim Zionism. How do you speak to those who adhere to this particular belief? This is a phenomena that uh, is increasingly becoming apparent. Uh, and maybe we began the discussion on the whole pattern of normalization. I do think that there has been a, a constant current uh, within the Muslim world, especially in the post-colonial period, which many of the uh, political leadership in the Muslim world uh, through the colonial and the post-colonial period that they see their uh, political position, the stability of their own rule is to be connected to normalization with Israel, which is seen as the doorway or a gate to uh, extension of support of the United States. In essence, in certain Arab and Muslim capitals, if you want to access Washington DC, you need to stop at Tel Aviv. And if you need to support a coup in your capital, you need to get the support of the United States and prevent an Israeli, Israeli veto 
on your political futures. So that knowledge is understood in the broader uh, leadership of the Arab and Muslim world. The second dynamic to this is also uh, that increasingly in the region, the primary threat has been crafted. Again, this is not what I believe, but the primary threat that has been crafted, especially among the monarchies, that your primary threat comes from Iran. And as such, in order to secure your own uh, right to rule, your own dynasty in relations to the monarchies, the only counterbalance to Iran threat is to ally yourself strongly with Israel because Israel is the only military capable uh, regionally to confront Iran, especially having the nuclear weapons. Now behind this, the United States is acting in its own interest in making sure that its hands on the oil is very well established, uh, both regionally as well as in the clash of civilization narrative, which sees that the Muslim world and China are the primary threats. So that's where you rationalize the neoconservative push to the uh, invasion of Iraq because China does not have its own independent oil resources. So you, you sit on the oil and you project that uh, in confrontation with China, you have almost a veto power to China's industrial base. So in this, you have this whole narrative of Muslim Zionists who right now utilize the same type of what you call distorted theology. And I think even to use the term theology with distorted is an insult to theology, but nevertheless, we have to go through that process. So they utilize certain verses of the Quran. They also began to use certain aspect of what you call Islamic spirituality and rationalize a whole particular normalization pattern that at the root of it for me is both anti-Muslim and anti-Jewish uh, in relations to Israel because, because at the core of it, it's only power, maintaining power relations, consolidating uh, uh, systems of rule, and more importantly, stoking the region to another war. I always say that it seems that the region, those who are embracing Muslim Zionism and Christian Zionism, and the Muslim Zionists, again, they buy weapons, they kill each other and they say Allahu Akbar. And I think that Allah has nothing to do with whatever they are doing, but in essence, it rationalizes and stokes the region into another cycle of conflict using this pattern of normalization. Uh, Israel in its, in, its, in its own perspective, it actually sees this as a good opportunity because for the long period, Israel does not want to deal with the Palestinians. And therefore by passing the Palestinians, uh, through negotiations with uh, or normalization with the United Arab Emirates or normalization with Israel uh, actually sets the Palestinian aside because we talk to quote the Muslim leaders and therefore the Palestinians could be bypassed. And I say to those uh, who are pro-Israel and Zionists say, listen, you could go all the way to the moon, but we're here in Palestine. At the end of the day, you're going to come. We have an address and it's called Palestine and you need to deal with it. So using Muslim Zionists to bypass Palestinians is just delays what you call, you might get what you call frequent miles in your trip, but at the end of the day, you don't need to cross that much because we're right here in Palestine, we're not going anywhere. And it's still, uh, you have to deal with the fundamental issue that there's six plus million Palestinians inside historical Palestine. And there is another seven to eight million outside of historical Palestine that are saying, Palestine is the issue and you still need to deal with Palestine. You need to end colonization, settler colonization and reconcil reconciliation cannot be by embracing uh, Muslim, Zionist, Muslim Zionists or Christian Zionists because they have their own theological, political power dynamics to play. And I think this is what we're experiencing in this current day. And you've already spoken a bit, a bit to the uh, normalize, normalize, uh, normalization. normalization relations that are that are certainly taking place. Uh, the UAE says uh, they claim that they are acting in the interest of the Palestinians by following through with these normalizations. Uh, what do you say to that? 
Well, I would expect MBS to have picked up the phone and called us before he actually speaks on our behalf. Mm -hmm. uh, do any of you uh, have any further thoughts on this particular uh, question uh, that was raised? Would you like to respond to Muslim uh, Zionism? Uh, maybe uh, uh, just uh, a small comment. Um, you know, uh, Christian Zionists actually played a major role in this normalization process. Uh, because like uh, two and a half years ago, uh, some of the leading American Christian Zionists actually went to the United Arab Emirates. They went to Saudi Arabia. They went to Bahrain. They met with the leaders there uh, and were really encouraging this kind of of normalization process. Uh, and so, so there is there uh, this connection. Uh, and the other comment I would like to say is that, you know, uh, uh, United Arab Emirates and Israel, they have lots in common. Uh, both of them, they spend $15 billion a year on militarization. So these are highly militarized actually states. Uh, and both of them, they fight wars, not on their terrain, but somewhere else. Uh, I mean, so, you know, when, when the Pope visited the United Arab Emirates, he hinted uh, saying, you know, it would be good if the uh, United Arab Emirates will make peace in Yemen. You know, in, in Yemen, they are bombing, you know, the poor people there on daily basis, you know, this is where peace is needed. Um, and the last comment is actually, it is, I mean, the United Arab Emirates are engaged in uh, what we might call, you know, public diplomacy. Uh, they want really to show themselves as a tolerant. They have the only country who has a tolerant minister. And so they brought the Pope. Uh, now they have this agreement with Israel, etc. Uh, and they uh, market themselves as the moderate Muslims against, you know, other Muslims. And so it's it's a it's a huge it's a huge and this is again another uh, another uh, things they have uh, in common with Israel is they have a huge now public diplomacy machine that they are fueling with their money. Just Thank one you. thing to yeah. add to what Mitri just said, just very quickly that this shows why it's just so obscene to refer to this as a peace plan when it really is about for, further militarizing that region. Thank you. Uh, Layla, did you have anything to add to this? Do you mean specifically on the issue of, of um, normalization or on Muslim Zionism? Uh, either or. Well, we could go on and on, but I'll, <laughs> I'll be brief. I mean, on the issue of like Muslim Zionism, and I'm assuming this refers to initiatives like MLI and others. I mean, I've said in the past, and I'll just say briefly, you know, especially when addressing those who you know, have either participated or intend to, or feel like this is a good thing is I, I use sort of from the Islamic narrative of, you know, Moses having been placed in the heart of central power with the Pharaoh, right? And so you can't get much closer to power than that. And yet he was removed from there, from the center of power by God, and then asked to challenge that power. Um, so that's usually the example I give, uh, because so much of this is about access to power, like everybody was saying, and um, not really about anything else, not about, you know, um, rights or justice or, you know, um, assisting the oppressed or anything like that. Um, and in regards to, you know, the normalization, I think we're going to talk a little bit more about this later. But, um, you know, this has never been, everyone's kind of mentioned this, but this has never really been about Palestinians. And Whenever you know, I'm asked, well, what about, what do Palestinians think? I'm like, they, they don't care. I mean, is it disappointing? Sure, is this a surprise? No, I mean, let's not kid ourselves. For years, Palestinians and anybody who has ever traveled on a Palestinian passport, you know, which I have before I became a naturalized citizen, will tell you, you know, um, Palestinians were never exactly treated great in the Gulf. They were Often, even before normalization, Israeli citizens were allowed to travel to the AE. This, you know, is not really a big surprise where Palestinian passport holders were not. So this has never come as a surprise. And I think what, you know, by way of context, like, you know, Brent was saying earlier, um, it, th this is all about access to power. But beyond that, 
you know, I think we're mistaken to assume at any point that a lot of these regimes have the Palestinian interests, you know, at heart or, you know, because people some, will sometimes be surprised and say, how could they do this? Don't they, you know, I'm like, no, they, they never really had Palestinian interests foremost in their mind, you know? Um, and I think when we establish that, then everything else kind of makes sense and you're not exactly going to be shocked by by any of this, but it makes, it forces Palestinians then um, and others who are in solidarity with them to have to restructure and rethink, which has already been happening, the approach um, that they will then have to take, right, so. Leila, continuing this conversation, I wanna ask you one about uh, US politics. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas has congratulated Joe Biden on winning the US presidency. Uh, Biden has promised to restore economic assistance to the Palestinians, to reopen the Palestine Liberation Organization office in Washington. Uh, these moves uh, are in place to reverse steps taken by U.S. President Donald Trump's administration. Kamala Harris said in an interview with the Arab American, we will take immediate steps to restore economic and humanitarian assistance to the Palestinian people, address the ongoing humanitarian crisis in Gaza, reopen the U.S. consulate in East Jerusalem, and work to reopen the PLO mission in Washington. Uh, I ask you, how likely is this? Will it significantly, in your opinion, improve the lives of Palestinians? And what are some of the foreseeable roadblocks? Oh. <laughs> You know, it's always so hard because I think as Palestinians, we're expected to have like a rehearsed response to a lot of questions that, you know, we should be saying, and yet it's always like two steps forward, one step back. Like we have such a low bar that, um, you know, I mean, on one hand, I will say that for a lot of Palestinian, pal Palestinian citizens who still have Palestinian authority passports and live in the United States, you know, reopening the, um, the the um, the office in DC just from a very practical point of view um, will will really be I mean a, a good thing for them because I it's just in practical terms it's almost impossible to renew your documents if there isn't you have to find this network of people who are traveling and send it with them and FedEx it back or whatever or whatnot so I don't want to really diminish that but on the other hand again it's just we're talking all about breadcrumbs here, right? Um, like, don't get me wrong, it's, it's very, all of the things that have unfolded under Trump are just horrendous, but we shouldn't be under the illusion that somehow things were great, you know, under previous administrations. And, you know, I mean, again, it's, it's great that we're hearing these things will happen, um, but there needs to just be more, more done. And, you know, I like to just specifically point to this, the paradigm that is often used of, um, you know, security for Israel, humanitarian assistance for the Palestinians, um, which is very problematic. And it feeds into the whole, you know, um, paradigm even used by, by um, aid organizations and so forth, where um, the, the, the basics need to be met. Palestinians need to have food security. Like that's all that matters, right? And, you know, you can think of it, you know, I you've probably heard mention of Gaza being viewed as, just giving the example of Gaza, um, like the world's largest open air prison, et cetera. And I'm gonna tie this in with the whole aspect of like that paradigm I was referring to of security versus humanitarian assistance. But, uh, you know, some go further and say, you know, prisons or prisoners are guaranteed certain things, right? They're guaranteed access to lights and water and food. Um, where Palestinians in Gaza are guaranteed none of those things and that the paradigm should rather be, and this is attributed to um, uh, Daryl Lee, um, Gaza should rather be viewed as a zoo um, where all the attention and focus is on the treatment of the animals and are they being cared for and do they have the assistance, you know, I'm translating it to human terms, humanitarian assistance that they need, but there is never mention of their freedoms, right, of their dignity, of their rights when this is what the conversation should be about. Yes, security also for, for the Palestinians, but, but beyond that, you know, not just humanitarian assistance, you know, their, their very basic rights and freedoms of movement and farming and fishing and travel and education. And so this is where I think the conversation needs to shift, um, um, not just to let's ensure that, you know, uh, Gaza has um, the certain calories that it needs to thrive or, or Palestinians um, for that matter, um, because you cannot, 
sustain, you cannot have, you know, um, a just and sustainable solution um, without that. And, and, you know, as I'm sure many in the room might agree, prospects for a two state solution itself is probably all but gone and, and illusory at this point um, and has been for quite a while. Um, so I don't really know how long we're going to keep sort of knocking our heads against the wall, but let's see and repeating the same kind of, of narratives. Thank you. We also have a few questions from uh, many who are in our audience. I'd like to raise a couple of these now and then we'll get back to some other questions that we have. And perhaps uh, Rabbi Rosen, you might be interested in this particular question. Uh, it is asked, how do student activists on campus fight for BDS and promote BDB, uh, BDS campaigns on campus? How would you uh, guide a student who is interested in promoting BDS? I think it's very difficult to be a uh, Palestine solidarity activist on college campuses because college campuses have become the flashpoint for, uh, for cracking down on BDS, I, I, you know, so the first thing I would say is that no, I mean, depending on the campus, it, the realities are different from campus to campus, but know that this is, uh, that you will be targeted, um, that this will be dangerous in many ways, that perhaps your professional futures may be endangered because, uh, because Palestine solidarity activists are, and Palestinian students in particular are being doxxed, you know, there is a an infamous website called Canary Mission that is uh, that is identifying largely campus activists for Palestine uh, to cause a kind of a chilling effect uh, to make sure that on their on their Google you know on their Google profiles uh, their activism, which is rendered in in very uh, uh, horrible terms on this website. Uh, will be will be high on the list. So the first thing I would say is that no, and I, I think most activists do know this, that it's it's not an easy road to go down. Um, I think Students for Justice in Palestine is a, a remarkable organization. Uh, it's always been very, very grassroots, very um, run by the activists themselves, uh, but they are horribly embattled. I know I've been uh, involved in trying to stand in solidarity with students all over the country to um, to let the world know that this is not anti-Semitic, uh, that in fact this is a struggle for liberation and justice like any other. Um, but for all kinds of political reasons, uh, it is probably the most fraught form of activism on college campuses today. Reverend Mitri, I think you are very familiar with the Kairos Palestine uh, document. Uh, that came out of Bethlehem in December of 2009, the full title of which is A Moment of Truth, A Word of Faith, Hope, and Love from the Heart of Palestinian Suffering. Uh, one section of the document reads, our word is a cry of hope with love, prayer, and faith in God. We address it first to uh, first of all, to ourselves and then to all the churches and Christians in the world, asking them to stand against injustice and apartheid, urging them to work for a just peace. Moreover, we declare that the military occupation of Palestinian land constitutes a sin against God and humanity. Any theology that legitimizes the occupation and justifies crimes perpetrated against the Palestinian people lies far from Christian teachings. Many in our audience may not be familiar with this organization. So, Reverend Mitri, can you take a few moments and speak more to uh, Kairos Palestine? Right. I mean, um, actually, I am one of the authors of this document. Uh, and the document was launched uh, at our uh, center in Bethlehem in 2009. Uh, the document was written by uh, a group of ecumenical Christian leaders. Uh, Catholic, Orthodox, uh, Protestant. Um, it's the first um, uh, Christian document where also uh, women and men were uh, engaged in writing it. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, is, it is the only right now, the only ecumenical forum in Palestine, really, where you have uh, people from different Christian denominations coming together on a regular basis. It's a movement, basically. It's more than a document. This is how I like to see it. 
um, and we, we wrote it over two years. And in 2007, we felt that the world was forgetting Palestine. Palestine was actually vanishing from the news. Um, and uh, so we wanted to remind the people that here there is a, a cause uh, that really the churches has to look to. Um, because, I mean, this is Palestine. Uh, this is where uh, Jesus was born, lived, uh, uh, and it, it means so much for the Christian community. Uh, but also, you know, this is maybe one of the most important just uh, causes in the world today. And we need churches to be courageous to speak uh, truth to power. Uh, and we called it uh, faith, uh, hope, and love. Uh, faith, we talked about really, uh, you know, how not to allow the Bible to, to be weaponized uh, for injustice, for, uh, you know, settler colonialism, etc. cetera. Uh, under hope, the question was how to hope when there is nothing to hope for? <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, <laughs> Laila was talking all the time about an uphill struggle, you know, I mean, uh, uh, always like facing, you know, a wall. So, so how to hope in such a, a, a situation? And there, uh, our, our slogan was, hope basically is what we do, is not what we see. Uh, and so it's a call for action. And the third regarding love, I mean, how to love your enemy and still to resist uh, systems of occupation, of injustice, uh, of discrimination. That was the question there. I think what is really very important today is that the Kairos movement is not anymore a Palestinian movement. It's an international movement. We have today groups in 27 countries who are really uh, working on, on the Kairos uh, document, on the Kairos spirit. Um, and their latest uh, document came out a year ago at our conference again in Bethlehem. It's a cry for hope, it's called. You can, uh, you can also Google it. Uh, so this is an international movement really for justice. Um, uh, and it's great to see that, you know, it's not only a Christian, but I mean, we have people from different faiths and people from no faith who believe in, in what we are doing. Another question that comes in from our audience and uh, whoever would like to respond to this, feel free to, but uh, the, the question is raised in the context of the fact that the only growing churches are Christian Zionists, and now we have an alarming and growing Muslim Zionism bringing about further deepening and widening of Zionist narrative. What are the chances for Palestinians, beyond great initiatives such as the Kairos document, to reinstate a sensible civic peace and reconciliation narrative to what is a political issue? Uh, who would like to tackle that question? Well, I, I think we are seeing the growth of Christian Zionism and Muslim Zionism, but I think it's symbolic of a crisis, a global crisis, much more than only Palestine and Israel. I do think that in thinking about both Christian Zionism and Muslim Zionism, one has to also contextualize about the whole success theology, uh, the whole power theology, where religion is no longer seen as really uplifting people. Uh, I always say that if Jesus, Muhammad, and Moses uh, were today alive, they will be in the protest in the front of the street. They will be in front of the White House. They will be part of the environmental movement. They will be actually undertaking all the needs to try to actually uplift uh, the human condition. So what we are experiencing today is religion, what I call imperial religion, is having its good day uh, in essence, seeing religion as possibly the sales people for the military industrial complex, for the prison industrial complex, subcontracting torture. And in essence, you would think that our prophetic tradition are CEOs of this global phenomena. And therefore it becomes an easy way for us to translate religion into power rather than religion as a way of understanding what is the deep uh, problems that are affecting human beings and that has been from the time of Pharaoh all the way to the present context. 
So I would say that what we need is, I would agree with, with uh, Mitri in relations to rethinking of how we actually engage in terms of uh, thinking about uh, hope is what we do, which is really very, uh, uh, you know, insightful, as well as a call to action of transforming the human condition. So in the face of this, uh, I think what we need for us who are committed to double our effort to go out to speak to the people, to engage in organizing, which I think that we, are, we have many, many opportunities uh, for rebuilding uh, a different world and a different horizon away from what we are seeing. It's very easy to actually embrace uh, Christian Zionism. It's very easy to embrace Muslim Zionism. You'll be what you call a, a boat on a plane. You have a VIP. You all of a sudden uh, be rubbing elbows with those who are important and significant in the, in the temporal view of the world. But actually, if you want that, that's always been available. The challenge is actually to be the person to actually say that there is a different world that is possible and to go out and actualize it. So I always say to people, the world that you want to see is here. You are the person that you need to get up and do the work that is needed because what I'm seeing is really preparing the world for another cycle of conflict. So I'm very critical. Saudi Arabia bought $400 billion of weapons for what? What are these weapons going to be used? The whole selling of uh, weapons of mass destruction, pouring gasoline on a region that has been inflamed. That tells you that the approach to the world that we are experiencing is basically preparing another cycle for 15 or 30 years of another war, another conflict, another destruction, which get me to, to close the cycle because you have the whole massive anti-immigrant, anti-refugee, uh, that is stoking white resentment in Europe and the United States. And my answer is very simple. If you don't want refugees, you don't want immigrants, don't create them. If you want peace, stop selling weapons. So don't come and put the microphone in front of a Muslim face and say, stop the violence. I say, stop selling me the weapons. 55% of the global market of weapons sales comes from the United States. So you can't preach on Sunday or Saturday or Friday on peace and justice while the rest of the week you were selling weapons of mass destruction this game has to be challenged and i think that's what i will tell somebody who's saying the increase of uh christian zionism muslim zionism is that we need to challenge the epistemical worldview that is at the foundation that pushing these two narratives uh, simultaneously and we're seeing its growth but without the challenge to it uh charles may i just add to that uh, you know um, it's interesting in the bible often uh, prophets felt that they are alone uh, and that almost everyone is against them and how can they do that? Um, and God was always telling them, actually, you are not alone. And this is how I like to see it, uh, actually, that there is a silent majority that we have somehow to activate. That is very important. Uh, but also, you know, when I look at the resilience of our people, uh, this is something not to be underestimated. I mean, you know, I mean, with all the powers that we are, we are facing as Palestinians, we should have vanished long, long time ago. We are still there. You know, uh, resilient, uh, you know, trying to live even our daily life in spite of all the difficulties we are having. So uh, there is no reason uh, to give up hope. On the contrary, I think. What we see should energize us to see, to, to know. I mean, who would have thought that the killing, you know, uh, 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 extermination of George Floyd will bring so many people on the street like in 86? I mean, if you would have told me uh, one year ago that this would be possible, I would have laughed like Sarah when she was told she's getting pregnant with 90. It happened. So never, never underestimate the power uh, of hope and the power uh, uh, for liberation. Leila, do you have any final thoughts regarding uh, this particular topic of uh, how to reinstate a sensible civic peace and reconciliation narrative to what is a political issue? Again, you have, you, you are Palestinian. You have spent a lot of time with the Palestinian people. What are you hearing? Well, first I should hear myself, but I'm muting. <laughs> um, you know, it's difficult because it's very easy to get um, 
worn down and burned out if you're in this for the long run. And I, you know, love what everyone talked about um, in terms of hope and, and you know, actualizing, um, actual, visualizing and then actualizing, right? And that's kind of what I've been doing on my own and with my family and in my community is what are the material things that I can do, that I can teach, that I can, you know, perpetuate um, in order to keep that hope alive. And that's what I would encourage others to do. I think it's, it's really difficult to look at the bigger picture and say, what can I as an individual, and maybe this is a question for everyone, we can end on that. What can any individual do to contribute to this? And because I'm sure a lot of people wonder the same thing, right? This is so much bigger than any of us and how can any individual possibly contribute um, to, you know, um, um, towards um, justice? I, there was a really great, um, you know, we say khutbah, like sermon that I listened to once about a question about if you can never really achieve justice, then should you even try, right? And, um, and the answer is that we will never have a perfect, um, you know, world because this is by definition um, in the Islamic narrative an imperfect um, space that we inhabit um, and that's reserved for the afterlife. But our obligation, our duty is always to strive towards a more just um, world. And so that's what I would offer is how, and then, you know, in our own individual capacities in our own, with our own skill sets and strengths um, to do that. But I think when we just think of it in, in sort of sheer political terms, it can be very overwhelming and we get sucked into that, the whole narrative and paradigms of, you know, that we were talking about before the two state solution, the security and humanitarian assistance, et cetera, et cetera, which I think are not really beneficial in a material sense to anyone on the ground. Um, we can talk all we want, but you know, I'm sure everyone that's living in Palestine and those that aren't, but are still affected by it as Palestinians will tell you, what does that really mean for the average Palestinian? Um, very little. But what they will always tell you whenever I have a chance to go back um, and visit um, is that please you know, tell people about our stories and you know, amplify our voices and um, you know, um, and I think that's for me what I see my role is, is being able to um, narrate the Palestinian experience as much as I can and I tell other Palestinians to do the same. Um, but, it, but it's tough, I won't lie. But you know, again, focusing on the small, you know, the ripple effect I think is where, but I would love to hear everyone's thoughts on what can an average citizen do, or, you know, those who are interested um, in seeing a change um, contribute. Thank you, Layla. And uh, of course, uh, you all uh, make up a stellar panel. Time is uh, coming to an end, and we're going to have to wrap this up. Uh, to those in our audience, uh, we're going to probably go over maybe two or three minutes, but I do want to give our panelists an opportunity to uh, share in about a minute or less any concluding thoughts uh, that you have regarding any of the topics that have already been discussed, or maybe something very important that you would like to say uh, as we uh, bring this to a conclusion. And Rabbi Rosen, if we could uh, begin with you. Sure, thank you. And, and just to thank you so much for having me. And I really appreciated this opportunity to have this conversation with colleagues and comrades who I really love and respect. Um, you know, I think as I'm mean, hearing the conversation develop, for me, what this really comes down to is that what we're seeing in, in Israel-Palestine is in many ways a microcosm of the world and in which we live in the moment in which we're living. And I, I just want to amplify what uh, the panelists who talked about the role of religion in all of this, and that religion can be used to uh, justify oppression and religion can be used as a tool for liberation. And I think we, uh, are finding, as Khatam said, that the, uh, the image of, or the vision of religion as uh, undergirding empire uh, is on the ascension right now, is clearly ascendant. And I think those of us who are people of faith really need to be able to say in no uncertain terms which side we are on. Are we, uh, are, are we going to allow our faith to be co-opted to uh, entrench empire and occupation and imperialism? Or do we see the most basic and perhaps the most sacred role of religion uh, as liberating 
the captive as a standing in solidarity with the oppressed, as calling for liberation on all fronts, whether it's in Palestine or anywhere in the world. And I think we are at a political moment and a historic moment where uh, that is utterly critical. Perhaps we've always been at that moment, but I think we're, we're feeling that in particular now. Um, so, you know, that's, that's what I would like to end with, um, that th this vision of, of sacred liberation is what we're really talking about. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bazio. Uh, just picking up on uh, Rabbi Rosen, I do think that we confuse the unfolding human history with divine history. And we attribute divine history into the work of man in its complexity, entanglements, desires, and so on. And we always want to see that what we are doing, in essence, have a certificate of guarantee from God. Uh, and I think what we need is to decipher this in a very clear way, uh, that the contradictions of the human being uh, is a result of all the factors in there. While we have a deep faith that we have a deep faith and belief in God, we would like to be on the side of God rather than always assuming that we are acting on behalf of God in a specific way, in essence. And we confuse power with uh, faith. Uh, the other part is that, would you have the same faith if you don't have power? Meaning that we often confuse worshiping power with worshiping God. And therefore we feel that we are in essence in a worldwide wrestling match of faith because we are powerful. And I would, this is for me is a deep reflection to think of when do we actually are pursuing power and we are, when are we pursuing really faith and understanding and humanity. The well, last in terms of calling to action, all action is local. So I encourage people to continue to do the work on Palestine as well as in other issues, you know, make sure to put events in the library, in, uh, get involved in the school board of education, the parents associations and so on, because at the end of the day, Palestinians in Palestine are doing their work, but it is our issues here, at least for us in the United States, we are entangled in those issues and we need to de-entangle de ourselves, not only in Palestine, but also in multiplicities of issues in building coalitions and making sure that we give birth to the world that we want to see and therefore get up get to work and uh, make the change possible. Thank you, Layla. Oh, I thought I had talked already in a concluding sense, but you maybe did. I'll, <laughs> I'll but offer something of hope. I was just reflecting, you know, again, it can be, it can be very um, depressing sometimes when we're talking about this, but I, I was just thinking back to when I was growing up, um, if you'll allow me um, to, to wax a little bit poetic, um, <laughs> You know, growing, I grew up in um, Saudi Arabia with frequent visits to Palestine, but um, I remember when I was in fourth grade having a project and having to go home and it was about, you know, writing about your country and, and whatnot. And I sort of like frantically flipped through the atlas and the, the you know, dictionary experience that perhaps many Palestinians um, had at the time in the early 80s and um, like not seeing Palestine and then just, you know, panicking and, and trying to identify and locate, you know, where we were from um and then you know it dawning on me that like we didn't exist in any um you know as a, as a people perhaps but not in any sort of modern um textbooks or you know official you know sense um and then going to college in the early 90s in um when i was in north carolina at duke and and also how just impossible and controversial it was to simply um, say or mention the word Palestine in any official sense, in op-eds you're writing in the newspapers, just saying that in and of itself was enough of an outcry, forget BDS, you know? Um, and so, you know, and again, small baby steps, but just reflecting on where we were and where we are now. Um, and in that sense, the kinds of opposition that we see, be it to BDS or college activism, as, as other panelists have said, should be viewed, I think, as a existential crisis for those you know um on, on the other side feeling you know that like you know the, the tide is starting to swing against you know those advocating for injustice i would say 
Um, so I just offer that as a sign of hope because you really do have to look on the, on the long term and um, you know and not get worn down and um, and for me a lot of it is about that is about you know um, keeping the hope alive and the small little you know actions that we take and um, being able to keep the you know you mentioned narrative you began with narrative I'll end with narrative that's so important to me. Um, being able to narrate our own experiences as Palestinians, I think, is incredibly important because there was many a decade when we, you know, relied on others to narrate our experience for us and legitimize what we viewed as legitimizing voices because nobody would want to hear our narratives. Thank so you. it was an honor to be able to speak with all of you and, you know, look forward to future conversations on the topic. Reverend Mitri, you have the final word. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think we are living, you know, in a very uh, dangerous time where populism and religion somehow uh, are, are uh, fusing together. Uh, and uh, I think really it is important uh, to give space for prophetic voices so that religion is not hijacked by those in power. This is the first thing. The second thing I would like to say, thank you for Notre Dame University for doing this panel. This is really great. Uh, and I would like uh, to encourage you to do more on the academia because even in the academia, it's a battlefield. And we need uh, more people in the academia to be engaged with the Palestinian issue. Uh, and not only the Palestinian issue because Palestine is a microcosm of what's happening worldwide. And so this is really our cause is the cause of so many people who are oppressed worldwide. And last but not least, since this is, you know, the Advent season and Christmas and people think of Bethlehem, you know, think that uh, the message of peace uh, was proclaimed in Bethlehem 2000 years ago, peace on earth, not the Pax Romana, but really a different kind of peace. And uh, my prayer and hope that we all work together uh, and great to see, you know, Christian Jews, Muslims, people of no faith are working together to bring real peace uh, with justice to Palestine and to the whole world. And to that, I think we all can say amen. Martin Luther King Jr. said, men often hate each other because they fear each other. They fear each other because they don't know each other. They don't know each other because they cannot communicate and they cannot communicate because they are separated. May this conversation and others like it foster sustainable peace between Israelis and Palestinians and lay the foundation for concrete strategies of action to take place. Thank you all for being part of this conversation. This conversation has been presented by the Ansari Institute and co-sponsored by the Lew Institute for Asia and Asian Studies, Program in Arabic and Middle Eastern Studies and Department of Classics at the University of Notre Dame. On behalf of Director Mahan Mirza and his staff at the Ansari Institute, thank you for joining us. Until next time, Goodbye.